Thank you so much. I love the opportunity to get together to sing. It's so nice, isn't it? I mean, how often do you have the opportunity to do that? I was cleaning out my car this week, which is something I don't do that often, and not nearly often enough, and I came across in this inner console a promotional um, credit card. And I thought to myself, where in the world did I come across that? And then I saw a friend's name on it, and it clicked with me. I remembered my friend giving this to me and saying, you know what, I've called in, I got this as a gift, um, it's got X amount of dollars on it, go ahead and use it for gas, to get to Siempre gas, to get to Jack's Produce, whatever you want. That'll be great, and on the back of it is the code written that he had already verified and everything. I started going to the gas station on the way down to Siempre, on the way to Jack's Produce, putting the card in the tank, typing the code, nothing ever happened. The thing always said it wasn't invalid, it didn't work, it was one problem after the other, and I would try it week after week. I talked to my friend, I did everything, nothing happened. Finally, I just threw it in my center console. That was that. I was over it completely. <laughs> this last week, I saw a news program that said that there's, you never lose the credit on these things. That the way most money is lost on these is that people just don't bother to call in and ask for it back. And in the state of California, for example, Ken and Trish every year give me, Debbie and I, um, gift tickets to the movies. Now, it used to be $25 for us to get into the movies for it, but now since we're senior citizens, um, Debbie and I used it Monday to go see Captain Marvel. Thank you, you guys. And as senior citizens, it's now only $23.50 to get in with these $25 gift cards that they give us to go with it. And so we went to the movies. There's $1.50 left on that card. Do you know that if I called, they have to send me a check for $1.50? Here in the state of California, that's, that's, that's what, so before you throw that thing away, you can't use it for candy, you can't use it for anything else, but they've got to do that. So I had seen the show, so I pulled out this card, and I called the number on the back of the card. I said, I found this card in my center console. It says it expired in 2018, but I don't know how many years it's been there. I don't know if it has any, well... Can you tell me the name on it? The name on it's Tom Weir. Can you verify the address? Oh, Lord, help us. I don't know Tom's address. Fortunately, I was in the office. Karen was in the office volunteering. Hey, Karen, what's Tom? I don't know. He lives on Hope Street. I'm thinking, well, praise God, there's hope. I'm saying he lives on Hope Street. I'm sorry, we need to have the complete address. Karen, I need the whole address. I can hear banging around on the computer. She gives him the address. I give him the address. They verify the address. Everything's good. Got the address verified. I need to know the city and the zip. I give them the city and the zip. Everything's good now. And they said, well, there's $100 on that card. I said, you're kidding me. There's $100. Yes. Where would you like a check for that mailed to? Well, just make that check out to Central Community, right at 5623 Arlington Avenue, and we'll have it to you in five to seven business days. So there's a check for 100 bucks coming to us, just because this little piece of frustration that sat around in my messy car all this time, I didn't just heave it when I found it. You know, almost all of us have been giving blessings in our lives that we're just hauling around and we're not cashing in. And you know, every single grace that God has given you, it is not expired. Every single grace that God has placed in your life, God, your Father, is just waiting for you to cash it in. He's waiting for you to use it, and he longs for you to come before him and say, how can I put this to work for you today? Lord, he said, oh, I've been waiting for you to ask. You don't even have to wait five to seven days. I am going to put that to work in my kingdom right now. We're talking about being lifted up, the uh, theme for the entire week, or entire month coming into Easter is lifted up, and the uh, theme text at the top of your card, that beautiful piece of art from the Gospel of John 12th chapter, verse 32, it's Jesus speaking, says, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people." To myself. And last week we talked about, well, why would Jesus ever say that or do that? And so we talked about because he loves us. Because he loves us so much. 
And this week I want to talk about the other half of that. Well, if he does love us that much, and if we are lifted up, what are we supposed to do with that great credit he's given us? And that's to shine brightly. You see, when you've been lifted up by Christ Jesus, your job isn't to make sure that everyone else is in line in the world. Your job is to be a bright light. Your job is to make sure that you're doing everything you can to shine just as brightly as possible because God in his son Christ Jesus dwells richly within you. And if he dwells richly within you, he cast out all darkness. And then there's only light that's meant to come out. So in the Gospel of John, the 12th chapter again, verses 9 through 11, it says this. When all the people heard of Jesus' arrival, they flocked to see him and also to see Lazarus, the man Jesus had raised from the dead. Now, here's Jesus traveling, and he's traveling with this man who had been dead, and he had raised him from the dead. Now think about it. We always teach, you know, wherever there are just a few people gathered together, that who's there with you? No one knows that verse? Who's there with you? Just a few of us are together. No one knows that verse? Jesus. Jesus, you guys. If just a few of you are together, Jesus with you. Let's say it. If a few of you are together, who's there with you? Jesus, come on. If you can't say Jesus' name out loud, you're in trouble, folks. I'll tell you, this is really a struggle. Now imagine, Jesus is coming into the group. Just a few of you are gathered together in his name. Jesus is there with you. But there's also someone who's been dead and brought back to life. Now when you're in your sins, what are you to Christ Jesus? You are dead. And when you give your heart to Christ Jesus, what are you made now? Alive. You see, Lazarus was just the first of many who was lifted up from the dead. And when you received Christ Jesus, you became just like Lazarus and celebrated that resurrection. And whenever you travel with Christ Jesus, there should be a crowd anxious to see you because not only is it Christ Jesus coming into the group, but now it's one who's been lifted up from the dead. It's one who, they remember the way you used to live. They remember the way you used to act they remember the darkness that once dwelled all around you, and now you carry a bright light. You were shining brightly. The crowds gathered, so it was with Lazarus and Jesus. Then the leading priest decided to kill Lazarus too, for it was because of him that many of the people had deserted them and believed in Jesus. How many people have deserted the ways of the world? and come to Jesus because of you? Because of your faith in God? How many people are just, just leaving their darkness and coming to the light because of you? You see, when that begins to happen, everyone's going to do everything they can to start to put a darkness over you. Everyone's going to do everything they can just to snuff that little candle out. But are you going to let them snuff that little candle out? No, you learn in Sunday school. You're going to let it shine, right? You're going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel? No, you're going to let it shine. All around the neighborhood, you're going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine in every single little child. Do you guys still sing that over there, Tricia? Sometimes good, I'm glad. Anyway, I mean, that's really an important thing for little children to learn, but it's a really important lesson for adults to remember. Because we get into the world and we forget to shine brightly. We forget that the most important task that we have as individuals, as those who follow Christ Jesus, is to shine brightly for him. It's nothing else. It's above all else. Do you have anything more important than to shine brightly for Christ Jesus to do in your life? Well, what about your kids? What about your marriage? Nothing more important. If you don't shine brightly in your marriage, your marriage isn't going to matter. If you don't shine brightly for your kids, your kids are going to get off course. The most important thing that we have to do is to shine brightly. So it says we can be sure we're shining brightly. First of all, when people see Jesus, 
when they seek us out in need. When people see Jesus, when they seek us out in need. You see, they went not just to see Jesus, but to also see Lazarus. People are not going to come to church because they think they're going to meet Jesus. People are coming to church because they think that you're going there. People are coming to church because they think there's good reason that you're going there. And then through you, they're going to meet Jesus. Through the way that you're shining brightly. You see, they don't relate to religion. What does the world see about religion? What did the world see about religion this week? A madman walking into a mosque, opening up and killing people in their prayers, and then division coming up over it? This is the truth. I had someone approach me. I wrote about it on Facebook, the horror of this killing. And someone said, Pastor Eric, aren't you concerned about taking a political perspective on this? I said, I didn't take a political perspective on this. This isn't a political thing. This is where every pastor and every religious leader in the world, every human, every human, not just even religion, every human needs to be in agreement on this. People are not supposed to walk into houses of worship and to kill people. You're not supposed to walk into bars and to kill people. You're not supposed to walk into any place and to just to shoot and kill people. And this person actually came back to me. Well, I don't know. You know, it was a mosque, and this does get down that I said, you know what? I think every, the gospel truth, what I wrote, I looked at what Franklin Graham wrote. We were kind of like in agreement. When Franklin Graham and I are in agreement, I mean, that's pretty big stuff. That's pretty big stuff, and I'm thinking to myself, we, I thought, these are not times that should divide us, friends. When tragedy strikes, that's exactly what Satan would want to use to bring darkness over the world. These are times when we're meant to shine brightly. These are times when the world needs our light. I've never been into a mosque. God, I don't know how many of you have been into a mosque. I never have. I have no idea what it's like to go into a mosque. I'm sure it's interesting. In Kenya, they have mosques in places, so I've heard the sound of the speakers when they do the call to prayer and all that kind of stuff. And to be honest with you, it's just kind of this loud noise that comes over crackly speakers that just, you, you expect it to be something really beautiful. Did not sound like that to me at all. You know, it just sounded like a distraction in the afternoon. But that being said, I saw the pictures this morning of all those prayer mats laid out with just candles next to them of the 50 dead members missing. And I tried to imagine it being central community. And I tried to imagine what the leaders in that church did, the Ken and the Eric, got together and they did to try to say, how are we going to honor these people who have been mowed down? And the heartbreak, and I thought about how important it is for us at a time like this to remember that first and foremost, we're called to love and to shine brightly so that people see that we've been lifted up. We may have been dead once. We may have been divided once. We may have been living in darkness once. Lazarus was. But we're alive now and we're living in the light so that people can see Jesus in us. Secondly, we can be sure we're shining brightly when we tell others because he's our life and hope. Why should you tell people about Jesus? Well, because he's your life and hope. Do you have any life and hope outside of Jesus? I want you to know, if you do, it's going to come to a close. It doesn't matter if it's with your health. It doesn't matter if it's with your finances. It doesn't matter if it's in your relationships. That part of happiness that you have outside of your hope in Christ Jesus is all going to come to a close. And only that which you have in Christ Jesus is eternal. And only that which we share through Christ Jesus will last. And for us to remember, it's our task to be telling others because he's our life and our hope. It says all the people heard of Jesus' arrival and they flocked to see him. I'm preaching from these texts as we come to Easter very deliberately because all the people 
came to see Jesus, I want to make sure that when we come to Easter, all the people are here at Central Community. Now, how did all the people know that Jesus was coming into town? Did they go on the internet? No, they didn't have the internet. Um, did they make sure to, I don't know what your favorite news station is. This is the truth. People ask me what news station I watch, and most of you know who come to church here. I don't have cable TV, so I don't watch cable. This is what I use online, so that you can clue in. I'll let you, and you can even use what I use. I recommend it. KTLA.com. I go to KTLA.com because there's like nothing into it, and like yesterday, I wasn't in town. At KTLA.com, I found out an airplane crashed in Riverside. They tell me that kind of stuff. I found out there was a horrible crash out next to Lake Matthews. You see, I can go to the other stuff. I don't find out about that stuff at the other big station. KTLA.com, they cover that stuff. And I can go to it, and there's not a whole lot of other garbage on it, but KTLA.com, they tell me that kind of stuff. And you know how long it takes to go through KTLA.com? Oh, about five minutes, if that, three minutes. I mean, it's like bam, 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 and you know, it's just like that. It's over, and it's done. And I don't have to spend three hours on the whole thing. I don't have to be inundated by everything else. It's just KTLA.com. And in light of that, you know, Tom Hatton died yesterday. God bless Tom Hatton. For those of you who, did any of you grow up watching Tom Hatton? Tom Hatton, what a sweet man. He was 92 years old. Yeah, died yesterday. Um, Kate, one of KTLA's lead guys. For those of us who are native Southern Californians, grew up with Channel 5, um, and, you know, it's just easy. What can I say? But for us, the world has changed tremendously. This man who went in to do all this killing, I mean, he had a camera on his head. He was live broadcasting it to YouTube and Facebook at the same time. Do you know, as of this morning, Facebook had already taken down the video 1.5 million times. That means they had taken down the original immediately, but 1.5 million times someone had copied the original, downloaded it, and uploaded it back up in different format, shortened it so that it would continue to be up there so other people who were consumed of this hatred could watch this man say, let's get this party started and head out and then walk in and start to mow people down. How dark is that? I can't imagine anything darker. I really can't. But it made me really thankful that I have a YouTube channel. I have a YouTube channel. All you have to do is go to Eric Denton on YouTube, and you can go to it. I, in fact, I checked my stats right before I came in here. They're down from last month. But this is what my YouTube channel got this last month, 7,700 minutes of viewing. That's five days, 24 hours a day, seven days, or five days of the week. This, that someone was viewing my, that's 10,000 views in the last 28 days. In the last 28 days, 10,000 views. Now you see, there are a lot of my videos, this truth, I make them, I go out on my runs and I stand there in the sunset, in the sunrise, whatever time I'm running and I just stand there and make this little video. And I try to say something encouraging. There are lots of them, this is the truth, I look at zero views. Nobody looked at it. And I think, why am I doing this? But imagine if each and every one of you did the same thing that I'm doing. Every one of you that had a smartphone, you started doing it. And every one of you already knows how to use FaceTime or use whatever you use, or iTime or iFace, whatever they have that stuff on Apple. You, you know how to do that. You could do it on YouTube. It's exactly the same. Don't I sound like an old man? I don't even know how to say this stuff. All you have to do is set it up, look at it like that, and it goes immediately to YouTube, and then you tell your grandchildren, your nieces and nephews, I'm on there once a week, twice a week, which days? And they started watching. And then, let's say, 20 times a month, your children and grandchildren got a witness from you. How many times are they getting a witness now? No times, maybe? But what if in the next year, suddenly they got 240 witnesses from you. And on top of that, when you died, that witness remained on YouTube. You see, all those hundreds of videos that I have on YouTube, when I'm dead, they're still going to be there. They'll be there forever. And my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren, everyone will be able to go see that. 
Your family can have a witness from you, and not just your family, but you know what? Someday, one of your kids can look at it and say, you wouldn't believe what my dad said. He told a story about you. Remember when you used to come to our house in elementary school? He told a story about you when you used to come over, and then he related it to his love for God. You ought to watch it. And then one of the kids who used to come to your house can see that. I came across a picture of my friend um, Steve Hoover, who passed away this last week. And, you know, I just told the story about that. But in the picture of us golfing down at, in Mexico at Real de Mar, there was Steve Hoover, John Porter, and Chuck Chapman are standing next to each other. All three of them loved members of Central Community. All three of them, good friends of mine, all three of them in heaven today. And there they are all standing next to each other on a golf course with us down there together. My son John and I and with Chuck, John and Steve. I thought, what a precious picture this is to me. And then Terry came by the other day and her daughter Jamie with pictures for Ken who's putting together the slideshow for Steve's funeral this Friday. It'll be up at Sandals on Friday, right? In Woodcrest at, at 11 o'clock. So if you'd like to go out this Friday, and Steve was such an important part of Central Community for so long, I know that the family would appreciate it if you'd like to go this Friday at 11 o'clock. And What a good guy Steve was in every way, and what a good friend. But I thought about how that, just me being able to tell a story about it and putting it on Facebook, it'll be there forever. Me be able to share it with Terry and Jamie and saying, make sure to tell Shelley. There are things that you have the opportunity to lift up that nobody else knows. You know how much money it costs to have a YouTube channel? Zero. You know where today the white nationalists are occupying the internet right now? YouTube. You know where they're circulating these videos right now that are out 1.5 million times in the last 24 hours? YouTube. What if Christians abandon it? Is it their fault or our fault? If we say we're not going to be a witness. I love the quote at the bottom of your card by Jody McDonald. It says, my why is that adversity is always worth it. A comfort zone is what you want to avoid. I don't know what your why is. Why are you a Christian? Why do you need to be a witness? Maybe it's that adversity is always worth it. Adversity is always worth it. This morning I went on my run, and while I was out running, waiting for the sun to rise, I was not thinking about my run. I wasn't worried about my run. I was thinking, what am I going to say to this stupid phone this morning? What kind of motivational moment? I mean, there was the adversity of thinking, what? I have no idea what I'm going to say to this stupid phone this morning when I put it up there, wait for the sun to come up enough so I can have a motivational moment. But you see, I don't have to do it. My life would be just fine without it. But the adversity is always worth it. And you are not my competition. If you suddenly all open up Facebook channels or YouTube channels or something like that, whatever they're called, you're not, we're all there together. We all get to be shining brightly. And your children and your grandchildren and your neighbors and your friends and the kids you went to school with can start saying, I cannot believe that Susan Beals has got a YouTube channel that's so cool. And they're going to be starting looking at that and saying, I'm going to do that. You know, but they're just all there. I can't believe Shirley's coming. That's so cool. Look at that. And all of the things we get to do. And all the people that get to hear it and see it and our story. Dawn came by this week when I wasn't here and she dropped off three tapes. One of them was of my dad singing church in San Clemente. One of them was of me preaching. One of them was my dad preaching. They were cassette tapes. Karen said, Pastor, you know, Don dropped these by. She talked to my wife. I carried them on the car. I said, I'm going to listen to these on the way down to the boat tomorrow. I looked in my car. I don't have a cassette player in my car. I don't know what. I haven't had a cassette player in my car for years. I don't know what I was thinking. I mean, I, my mind, that's where my, I, it's already empty. I haven't had a, but there I was already there. I couldn't wait to hear my father's voice. Again, and that's the gift we give the future. The gift we give the future is 
that witness that's going to carry on long after we're gone third, we can be sure we're shining brightly when our story becomes a part of their transformation. You see, your story, the story that you have to tell, that can be a part of the transformation of the people in your family, but if you don't tell your story, it can't be a part of their transformation. If you go onto my YouTube videos, one of the YouTube videos you'll see way back, like eight years ago, is Central Community's original outreach video from 1992. And on the face of that, the very front of it, YouTube picked out the nicest scene from that entire five minute video. It's Linda's Astro. And there's Linda's face right there. And there's Linda looking so nice and so young and she's nice. And if you watch the video, Linda will say, oh, since I've come here, I don't feel guilty anymore. I feel so much better. This has been such a great. And she's telling her story. That story has been told on my YouTube ever since YouTube opened up. I mean, it's always been there, and you can see how many people have watched it, how many people have heard that story. It's still going on. A part of the transformation that took part in Linda's life is a transformation that's going out into other people's lives. You see, until you tell your story, no one can hear your story. It says the man Jesus had raised from the dead. Do you think Lazarus ever told his story? I'm guessing every day. Hey, I was dead, man. You guys wouldn't believe me. I mean, like, dead, dead. I was dead, like, in the ground dead. And he called me out. I mean, how many of you were, like, dead in sin dead? How many of you remember well how far you were from Christ Jesus? And when was the last time you took the time just to tell someone, hey, I know you may see me looking cleaned up with a haircut now, but I always didn't look like I was in the military. And there was a time in my life when I looked a whole lot different, I acted a whole lot different, I was a much different person. And for each of us to remember that our story is that important part of our transformation. How many of you have hit a butterfly with your car this week? Oh, man. I'll tell you what. I've thought about if reincarnation is true, I have sent entire genealogies up into heaven. I'll tell you what, if all these butterflies are really someone else, you know, reincarnated... But this is the part I've gotten about this. I don't get it. This whole immigration of butterflies. Do you understand it? Maybe someone can explain it to me afterwards. And I hear they're coming up from Mexico and flying somewhere up north. I don't know where, up to Northern California or Canada or someplace. Someone like that. But how does it work? Okay, so I'm assuming that means they were in cocoons in Mexico, right? And all the, which meant they were caterpillars in Mexico. Which meant they made cocoons and then they fly up north, and then what do they do? Do they have eggs up north, and they turn into caterpillars, and they crawl back to Mexico? I mean, is that what they do? They get to fly north, and they have to crawl all the way back and make the cocoons? I mean, how do they get to Mexico again then? I really don't understand how this happens. The whole thing's been confusing, you know, for you and me, and that's just a simple butterfly. I don't understand how it happens. And I think 100 years ago, how many millions of butterflies made it up there that it didn't end up on a windshield of a car in the grill of a truck? So many more that today are just getting slaughtered on the road. And in the same way, I mean, how many more of us, you know, the world just occupies us. We get whacked and knocked down. Oh, man, we've got every excuse not to make it through this transformation. And beyond that, it's confusing. We don't understand it. How am I supposed to make it all the way back, crawl all the way back? I don't get it. And for us to say, you know, my story, I don't understand every aspect of it, but let me tell you what I do understand. Charles Stanley said this, his voice leads us not into timid discipleship, but into bold witness. Not into timid discipleship but into bold witness. Are you a bold witness for Christ today? Fourth, we can be sure we're shining brightly when our fate is determined by our walk with Jesus. When our fate is determined by our walk with Jesus. It says the leading priest decided to kill Lazarus too. The leading priest decided to kill Lazarus too. You know, I think when they start shooting people in churches and mosques, there are a lot of people who think, yeah, you know, maybe I won't be going to church. If they're going to be bringing guns in. 
And they forget in Christianity that we kind of revel in the fact. In fact, we've put this great big cross right in front of everything. The way we kill our Lord, and they killed our Lord and Savior. And our Lord and Savior, he even told us, unless you lift up your cross and follow me, you're not even worthy to be my disciple. I'm not calling you to timid discipleship. I'm calling you to be a bold witness. And for us to say, I'm not going to avoid my faith, but I'm going to understand that my fate is determined by my walk with Jesus. My eternal fate, by how brightly I shine. And that's okay. That's the way I want it to be in my life. I want to this to be about Christ Jesus radiating out through me in everything I say and in everything I do. Charles Spurgeon said, someone asked, will the heathen who have never heard the gospel be saved? He responded, it is more a question with me whether we who have the gospel and fail to give it to those who have not can be saved. See, the Great Commission wasn't about all those who are lost. The Great Commission was about all those who are found. And are you going to go into the whole world and shine brightly? Because Jesus said this about you. You are the light of the world. He didn't say, I am the light of the world. He said, you are the light of the world. And without light, there's only darkness, friends. And when it seems like the world is only getting darker, it's our task to shine more brightly in every area that we can. The only thing that casts out darkness is light. And for us to carry that light everywhere we go and to say, you know, I want to stand before my maker, knowing that I have been filled with his love in everything I say and in everything I do. That anyone, those people in Christ Church who are heartbroken from that mosque today, I like to think every one of us here at Central Community would welcome them in today. Wouldn't you welcome them in today? Wouldn't you lovingly embrace them and hold them in your arms and grieve with those who grieve and weep with those who weep? I, not anybody I've ever gone to church with here at Central Community, I don't know anybody who wouldn't. This is where we are united, friends. We are united. There are many things that we disagree about in life, and that's okay. And the things we disagree about should never be dividing factors in the areas that we're united. And we are united in His light, in His love, that understands that we weep with those who weep. We grieve with those who grieve. We mourn with those who mourn. And we always turn away from the heartbreak that devastates. My father was a medic in World War II. He tried his best not to be a medic. He fought to not be a medic. Once he saw the violence going down and once he was in the whole Battle of the Bulge and all that kind of stuff, and he went to beg not to be a medic, and, and they wouldn't let him. They said, no, we see your spiritual background. It came from his family signing up to go in as a medic because they didn't want him to carry a gun. and said, we don't want that to be on you. But my dad used to tell this story. He'd say, you know, when the battles were over, we would be right on the front line with everyone else. And he said, we would be sent out to treat our soldiers and the Germans. He said, you're kidding me, Dad. Like, didn't you just carry a gun and shoot the Germans? He said, no, he said, but here's the other side of the coin. He said, the Germans, their medics, we would cross them on the field often, and they would treat our men. And that's why, in fact, here at Central Community, when I first came here, there was a man who would often talk about being a prisoner of war in Germany during World War II and talk about the way he was treated. And did you know that here in the United States, we had prisoners of war camps right here in the United States where they would bring German soldiers over and we would keep them in prisoner of war camps? Because... We were expected to treat each other, even as enemies, as humans. In the church, friends, we may disagree with someone else's faith. It doesn't mean that they're not humans and not children of God. 
means that our job is to shine brightly. And finally, we can be sure we're shining brightly when our faith begins to build and grow the fellowship. And how do you know for sure? I mean, how do you measure your bank account? Anyone know how you measure your bank account? Nowadays, you normally do it online, right? You used to have to go to the teller and say, what's my balance? They'd write down a little piece of paper, and they'd do all that kind of stuff. Now you go online, you go on your phone, you go out, whatever you do, and you find out what your balance is, see if you have enough money to spend whatever you're going to spend your money on this week. Make sure that everything's cool. How do you do it in your spiritual life? How do you find out what your balance is? Because it was because of him that many of the people had deserted them and believed in Jesus. Is your faith building and growing the fellowship? Is your faith working out into the world? Are you shining your light brightly? If there was ever a time to say, it hasn't so much, Pastor Eric, now is the time. And if there were ever a time to kind of trim your wick, do you know what that means, to trim your wick? I don't know, I guess maybe I'm just old. You know, to trim your wick, you know, to, to tighten it up and make sure the light starts to shine a little bit more brightly, it's now until Easter. As we come towards the resurrection, this is a great time for us to say, I want my faith to build and grow the fellowship. I want my faith to be all about that which God is going to do. I love the fact that this week we're getting a check for 100 bucks from this card. I just love it. I mean, I love it because I didn't just keep this card. I can't tell you, I was so close to just throwing it away. I had gone online and it said it was dead, the card, right on the front of it. It said the card was past the due date. But I love the fact that we're still getting a $100 check. And one of the reasons I love it is this, not prideful, but I'm glad that I didn't give up. I'm glad that I kept on calling until I got a hold of someone and who put me through and got it. But none of that would have happened if I wouldn't have seen a news story where someone told me that. I think it was on KTLA. Um, for each of us, I've been an advertisement for KTLA today, haven't I? I learned up. Um, for each of us, you are carrying credit in Christ Jesus in your heart and your home that you're not putting to work. For each of us, you're carrying credit that your children need, your grandchildren need, your neighbor needs. And as we come into Easter, there is no time better than now. And then, as you see the news stories in the world, you're carrying credit that the world needs you to shine brightly right now. There are people who are already on the fence about God. They're already on the fence about religion. And then they see these kinds of stories and they're thinking, well, buddy, was I right? I don't need anything to do with God. If this is what the Christians do to the Islamic people, and they make videotapes about it, and they talk about how right they are to kill these, I don't have anything to do with God from any quarter. And it's time for us to shine brightly, friend, and to say we want to make sure that in everything we say and do, we're shining brightly. Simple prayer at the bottom of your card says this. Jesus, take me with you to Easter. I don't want to miss the parade, the prayers, the trial, the cross, the silent mystery of Saturday, and especially not the resurrection. Take me with you and give me courage to extend my hand to bring everyone I meet with me. Help me shine brightly for you every day. Thanks. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for loving me, God. I thank you for letting me be a part of Central Community and share a bit of the story that you've given me this morning. I would ask for each person here this morning, you might write across their hearts, Thanksgiving, Father. You might write across their hearts the desire to share their stories with their children, with their grandchildren, with their family, with their neighbors, with their parents. That you would open the door to the thousands of hours, God, where their story can be shared here in Riverside and around the world. 
I would ask that you would use us to shine brightly for these avenues, Father, in technology where darkness seems to roam so freely and people are occupying them with hate, God. I would ask that we wouldn't whine about it and complain about it, but instead that we would occupy it with love, God. That we would step in and we would make use of these incredible avenues of love, Father, and that we might be the people that would give you glory, give you praise, give you honor, and like Lazarus, stand up alive and be a witness for you, Christ Jesus, like Lazarus, that we might remember what it felt like to be dead and to celebrate in this new life. And then, Lord Jesus, I would ask that the world could see the celebration of this new life, God. And as we come to Easter, your resurrection would be lifted up. We thank you so much for everything you've given us, God. We would ask that you would make us a healing community filled with hope in the days to come. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.